Hello and welcome to a program of Exile Kulturkoordination in Essen. We are having an interview today with the Kenyan writer Yvonne Adimbo Ovua. She's born in Nairobi, Kenya in 1968. She studied English and history at the Kenyatta University, earned a Master of Arts at the University of Reading in UK and a Master of Philosophy in Creative Writing from the University Queensland in Australia. The literary magazine Kwani, by, uh, who was, which was founded by Binyavanya Vainaina, published her short story, The Weight of Whispers, which earned the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2003. Dust was her first novel, published in 2014, it is dealing with Kenya's history and her second novel, The Dragonfly Sea, was published in 2019. The book is a nowadays coming of age story with multi layers of globalization issues. For instance, Asian African transocean relations. Over short stories and essays were published in um, range of international journals and magazines. She lived and studied and worked in many countries all over the world, in the US, in Australia, in Africa, in Europe, and has been in Germany twice for academic purposes and is now a guest of the Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst in Berlin, and she lives in Nairobi. Yvonne. Do you want to add something? I've tried to summarize the most important stations in your life. Yeah, you have been absolutely succinct and wonderful. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you for the interview. Okay, then I would like to start with the questions we have prepared for you. So we are dealing with the uh, sustainable development goals. And we would like to know, have you already come into contact with these sustainable development goals? through your work or in your personal life? Mm. Um, certainly uh, in one way or another, but uh, perhaps one of the backgrounds, my own, uh, in a, my own academic past, uh, was as a development uh, student mm -hmm. from the University mm -hmm. of Reading. Okay. So I was very aware of the, you know, the UN goals, even from that time, that motivated my own study mm -hmm. in social development. And uh, I was around the time when Millennium Development Goals happened. And then they moved on to Sustainable Development Goals. So yes, I've run into it, plus the, there's a lapel ring with many colors that mm -hmm. all those SDGs um, wear, so yeah. And in your personal life, I mean, um, are there any uh, issues which you find most important? Mm. You know, Part of the reason I stopped development, or I, I call myself a reformed and repentant former development worker, mm -hmm. is simply because I stopped believing in the, the kind of the, the big development um, policies that are established and written in capitals outside of the place where people actually have um, different ambitions and aspirations. So that, that becomes my um, point of departure. But having said that, uh, every effort, every human effort that is geared towards um, uh, bringing a kind of, um, uh, what do you call it, raising um, the standards of lives of all peoples of the world mm -hmm. is highly commendable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So could you think of um, any uh, of the goals that has influenced your work? None. I mean, also your <laughs> work as a writer? None, none whatsoever. Uh, none, none. Um, and, and probably it goes back to the fact that I come from a, a position of, um, uh, rather than objection or resistance, of indifference. Mm -hmm. um, so no, not, not one of those. But having again said that, there are places where our interests converge. Um, the SDG uh, um, um, aspiration is towards the, uh, the, the, uh, the creation of a more equal world, uh, a world where the well-being and, and, and wholeness of, of humanity and the earth um, um, can converge. Um, my own literature and my own quest as an artist 
is around the questions. What does it mean to be human? What does the humanity of the other mean for me? Um, what does it mean to live and to live well? Um, so perhaps what we have, the SDGs and I, are places of convergence and themes where we meet one another, I guess, yes. So uh, how do you deal with the um, issue that uh, some people, especially in Germany, uh, call your latest novel a so-called globalization novel? <laughs> I think what happens is that uh, my, my precious German readers uh, recognize um, Uh, elements they call globalization um, in the novel, but even though the novel itself roots itself very much in an older form of globalization, uh, the, the Indian Ocean global um, monsoon matrix, um, that was a form of um, exchange and trade that involved multiple nations. And uh, even though we call it global globalization now, the idea of interaction and exchanges among peoples, um, Uh, across cultures, across geographies, is an old, old human story. I'm glad they find that uh, to identify with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the historian who is talking. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yes. um, Yvonne, can you think of one or more positive examples of how development goals are being worked on in one of the African countries? And how can this work be used as a model for countries in the EU? I think the challenge with that question comes from the, um, I think the word is ontology, the original idea of what development has been structured to mean, certainly within the African continent. And, and that also then goes back to my own entry into development with rose-colored lenses. And entering into this world and finding that um, development was treated very much in a lot of these spaces as a, just another economic program, benefiting the beneficiaries. And uh, so I lost. Uh, you're talking. Uh, you're talking about somebody who got disillusioned, a romantic who got disillusioned. When you discover, for example, that 80% of the resources allocated to development never leave the source country, right? So. Um, I don't know if there is a place where we can actually learn from one another when a structure, when an idea is, it is itself flawed. But maybe what, uh, what happens, maybe one of, the, one of the spaces where we can perhaps um, you know, focus on or, or benefit from is the idea of human exchange. The one thing that the development uh, um, matrix allows is human beings from different parts of the world to encounter one another in other parts of the world. What happens there maybe is part of the problem in that um, uh, the, the privileges as well as the assumptions of dominance then end up being played out and that's a, and that's a pity because then we lose out on, on, on what the gift of human encounter and human experiencing and human openness to one another can provide. So maybe, yeah, I think, there, I think there are great possibilities that can be achieved if the um, development matrix as it is can be restructured. Mm. Yvonne, what role does education and especially education of national history plays in your works? Yes, it plays a big, big role <laughs> because I guess that's the way in which, uh, even as an artist, I um, enter into different societies to discover their heart, to spy on their soul and their spirits. I'm, I'm conscious of the long resonance of, of history, uh, the idea of history's timelessness, even though we want to say past, present and future. History doesn't respect our human categories, does it? Um, so I, I, I treat history both as a palette, uh, a, a paint, uh, you know, one of my paint boxes um, to inform my literature. And, and, and maybe that is a bit mischievous, but I do that. Um, but I also draw from history to understand a culture, a place, a humanity. Um, and, and for me as an African and as a Kenyan, 
um, I use not only our own history, but I use the history of the world to try to understand not only my place, but the place of my country in itself, in the world and in the future. And you, you have spent um, parts of your education in different countries, so mm. how much uh, did this influence your, your work? Ex extremely and extensively. Um, um, part of my ongoing education is that, uh, you know, the idea, the gift and the privilege of travel means that my, my education is always ongoing. Um, there's always something new and exciting and sometimes horrifying, or, but always beautiful to discover about human pasts, human achievements, human failures um, in every space that I am allowed or I enter into. Um, and each one, each thing I learn influences and changes and informs and I think deepens or, uh, you know, clarifies my own writing. So I'm really grateful actually for that opportunity. From your perspective, how can joint work between nations on the world development goals be done equitably? Can you think of positive or negative examples? I think maybe I referred to it before. Uh, one of the positive examples is uh, the gift of encounter. Um, and and, and the, I, I don't think we fully appreciate the, the power, the mystery and the magic of human beings who are strangers meeting one another. And even if they don't speak the same language, um, daring to find a place of uh, um, human connection. Uh, and that is, that is beautiful for me. And, and I think we need to, I feel that we would stay, if we stayed more in that moment of connection without imposing an agenda or a, a, a presumptions, I think something beautiful would emerge. Uh, I think then what happens is then the policies that are created usually in capitals that have absolutely no connection or live out of a fantasy of, a, of an Africa that is singular rather than say 55 different countries, um, it, it then enters into that place of beauty and, and spoils it and corrupts it. So um, to, if, if development could enter into spaces without an agenda, and to listen to the aspirations of the people in the place. People know what they want. They don't need to be told what they want. People have great ambitions uh, for themselves and for their children. Um, so when, so in my case, you're talking about a negative example was, um, without naming the organization involved, it's a very significant NGO. Uh, and the problems we saw have only emerged now kind of 20 years later. Um, Uh, you know, all, all, you know all, the, all the abuses, all the presumptions, all those things that we saw then um, are only emerging now. Um, so one of those organizations, we end up in a place in, in Ghana, northern Ghana, um, purporting to go, um, I used to be a believer then, to help women, help empower women, those are the terms we use, put children into school um, and, uh, and uh, expand their business opportunities. And we go into this place, and what you find is that um, uh, you have these women who's, who's part of whose cultural value for centuries has been built around trade and were involved in the great uh, uh, you know, trans-Saharan trade systems. Uh, they had nothing to, uh, yet we came in, and at that time I was associated with a, again, I won't, uh, so that I, no fingers can be pointed, it was a European-based uh, development organization that had their ideas of how these women ought to be without taking the time to understand their history, um, their capacity, their knowledge, which was extensive, beautiful, and had so much wisdom attached to it. So we went in there with all our presumptions, our book knowledge, to say we are here, and we are on your side, and we're here to empower you. And what's so lovely about those women, they say, we hear you, we welcome you, but what do those terms actually even mean? One of the things we discover, these women are, are, uh, are what do you call it, are, are, if you want, managers and administrators of vast cattle herds. You talk about, you know, 2,000 cattle collectively. 
uh, and are able to move these cattle right across geographies uh, and trade with these. And, and we, it never occurred to us that we were being presumptuous and stupid, right? So to be open in that way. So that would be a negative example. The positive one is what if we had gone in there with an interest of mutuality? We are here to learn, uh, to also grow for ourselves. We are here to figure out what are the ways in which um, your own uh, uh, you know, enterprise networks can expand further um, than they are right now. Um, if only we had gone in as human beings and not as people, not as messiahs with a solution to deliver uh, to people. Yeah, so there's that. There's, a, and I think, an example that I use in the book, The Dragonfly Sea, uh, where, again, uh, certain friends of ours end up on Pate Island to build a well. Uh, and they want to build a well. And they go in to build a well in an island where they can see some of the oldest historical examples of sewage and water systems. They, Pate Island had sewage and water systems long, long, long even before Europe thought to have water and sewage systems. So these guys walk in, and this was a, a few years ago, and said, so we're going to build you a well. Of course they're going to build you a well without asking the Pate residents, why don't you have wells here? So they spend over eight months building a single well. Usually other places, it takes about four weeks to build a well. And, they, and it was guarded by you know, strong, muscular soldiers, this well. And then they have an opening ceremony involving ambassadors of many nations. Again, none of these nations will be implicated. And then they cut the ribbon. And then the ambassador of this great country it symbolically takes a cup of gla a glass and dips it into the well, and he drinks the water. And then he understands in drinking the water why Pate Island had never set up uh, wells because the water is brackish, it is salt, it is absolute poison. <laughs> yeah. And no one else tasted it before this, they this presumed, official ceremony? They presumed to know. If they had asked even the basic fisherman, why doesn't Pate have wells? The fisherman would have told them the history of Pate, that the water is brackish. That is why they did not build wells. If they did not, it's not that they did not build wells because they did not know how to build wells. Yes. So again, when, and, and I think again, it still remains a problem. I don't know why it's a persistent problem. Simply ask. People actually know what they actually need. Yes. Um, so I guess I, I guess there's the you know the, it's it's both the good, the good and the bad is implied. The possibilities are immense if we are humble, if we walk into spaces with humility, and 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 understand that people actually know what they need, and their needs may not fit into the development goals. If you go into one of the the spaces of you know, and somebody says actually my need is that uh, uh, my multi-history shipbuilding enterprise can be secured both as a site of heritage but also so that I can train another generation in shipbuilding without nails which is which is the nature of you know um, places like Pate Island there's no space for that kind of person in the social in the development goals yet it is, is a priority say for a, for a place like Pate Island um, so there are that's why I, that's why I feel that the, even the ontology the structuring of the idea of development um, is long, long, it, there's a great need uh, for a revision. Uh, like I said, we had Millennium Development Goals, now we have the, what do you call it, the, the SDGs. There'll be another DG thing coming later, uh, or simply because I think um, uh, the, the humanity, the humility, um, the, the, the rooms of human encounter uh, get overwhelmed by policy and meeting outcomes and goals, right? Yeah. Goals. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you would like to add anything else, you would especially like to say to, let's say, pupils or students in, in Germany, then maybe this would be a chance. Oh, really? Oh, that's, that's, that's lovely. Just to say, first of all, hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello, young people, and to simply also say, look, the future is yours um, to design, to write again. 
I hope you write a more uh, human, humble, uh, but also more beautiful story. I hope that you inscribe great and immense and wonderful new dreams that involve, that are inclusive and are caring and are rooted in an understanding that uh, the histories of the world are complex, are complicated, and that uh, humanity is also complex and complicated and that no one size fits all. And uh, I think one of the things I hope your generation will do is to make sure that please spare, the, uh, the, you know, please spare us another generation of people who will think that Africa is just one country. It's an immense, rich, beautiful, again, a complex uh, space of many, many, many countries and many, many kinds of geographies. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you.